Hello. I hope you all are doing okay and hanging in there, everybody. Uh, the last couple of days have been quite lame, um, and I'm sure people are feeling combinations of, you know, anger, grief, uh, frustration, um, and know that I'm here for you if you need to talk about anything or just want to, you know, be pissed off together and talk about stuff. Um, but yeah, just, uh, you know, reach out to me if you need anything. I'm real in two. Um, and yeah, I think a thing that's bringing me solace right now is just remembering that social movements have historically overthrown oppressive forces like this to preserve democracy, and they have won. So uh, keeping that in mind as a, a little beacon of hope, uh, you know, capitalism and, you know, all of its subsequent effects that, you know, we're experiencing currently in action. Um, it is a relatively new historical phenomenon, so I kind of take comfort in that. But yeah, so we are talking about a topic today that is very relevant to, you know, recent uh, current events, and we're thinking about uh, settler colonialism as an ongoing structure. So thinking about the formation of the U.S. as, you know, a project intended to, you know, create hierarchies, reproduce power, and thinking about, you know, the connection that that shares to, um, you know, uh, the displacement of indigenous populations and the genocide of indigenous populations. So I will say that, you know, as a content warning for this discussion, there is, uh, you know, conversation about violence. There is some uh, conversation as well about a disordered eating, and I'm thinking about what else are we discussing? Yeah, just, uh, you know, generally know that um, there is some heavy subject matter, so be aware of that going into it. So, all right, let's think about settler colonialism and how Evelyn Nakano Glenn discusses it. So, you know, she talks about how settler colonialism must be understood as an ongoing structure rather than a past historical event. So with that, thinking about how the logic tenants, uh, the identities engendered by settler colonialism continue to exist and shape race, gender, class, and sexual formations in the present. So, you know, in order to think through, you know, what will it look like to dismantle settler colonialism as a project and thinking about, you know, all of its nefarious effects, thinking towards decolonization as a necessary goal, you know, which involves thinking about liberation rather than a politics of liberal inclusion. So she discusses, you know, how do we differentiate between liberation and, you know, this project of liberal inclusion. And, you know, for her, it involves going beyond narratives and logics that, you know, really center individuality, property, capital, so thinking about, you know, the acquisition of wealth, thinking about competition, and things like that. So thinking about how decolonization must be understood in relation to dismantling systems that prioritize profits over people and structure the way we see the world, the way we interact with one another in terms of hierarchy. So I think about how a lot of the grief happening right now, a lot of the despair feels so interconnected with, you know, this resulting impact of capitalism and settler colonialism that has served to, you know, frame everything in terms of individual change. So there's been so many pushes to, you know, vote, to engage in these individual projects of, uh, you know, showcasing your politics um, individually through consumption, through, you know, sharing things on social media. And, you know, thinking about, you know, obviously sharing information on social media is important, but thinking through, you know, what it will look like to see our liberation as bound up with one another and, you know, thinking towards facilitating collective action and, you know, looking towards um, structures of interdependence as opposed to these structures of individualism and competition. So thinking about, you know, this is really key to, you know, countering uh, settler colonial narratives and thinking about how, you know, if we look historically at settler colonialism and what the goals of settler colonialism is, we can see its impact towards the present day. So, you know, of course, you know, settler colonialism has, you know, 
intended to, you know, do this work of occupying land and eliminating indigenous populations, such as with the British colonization of North America. So, you know, through events like the massacre at Wounded Knee and the Trail of Tears, um, we saw these, you know, egregious examples of genocide and subsequent marginalization of indigenous folks to reservations or demanding their assimilation to colonial ways of life. And so with assimilation came the placement of native children in boarding schools. So, you know, boarding schools uh, saw mandatory family separation, um, you know, it, uh, you know, forced native kids to unlearn native ways of being and seeing. It taught them colonial gender norms, so these rigid divisions of labor, colonial conceptions of masculinity and femininity. Um, and so, you know, with that, you know, with, you know, attempting to assimilate children into colonial ways of life, there was also this reconfiguration of the relationship to the land. So instead of seeing humans as, you know, having a symbiotic relationship with the earth um, in order to produce some form of harmony, uh, you know, it contrasted with colonial perceptions of the land as property. And, you know, with that um, carrying out treatment of the land as property and, you know, having extractive relationships with the land to, you know, gather as much natural resources as possible to support colonial ways of life. So with this, you know, it is really key to think about how American national identity and capitalism, you know, was founded on these, you know, settler colonial logics through these settler colonial practices. It was central to the formation of U.S. whiteness and national identity. So thinking about you know, this concept of the American dream and looking back to, you know, the founding of, you know, the United States, there's, you know, all of this uh, revisionist history that goes into that when it comes to, you know, the disavowal of settlers' violence and, you know, genocide, and instead thinking about constructing, you know, this narrative of a grit and determination, um, building a life from scratch. Um, so it is important to think about this was, you know, the start of constructing this notion of civilization and thinking about civilization as, you know, being very central to a conception of U.S. whiteness and guarding that conception of civilization with violence. So, you know, thinking about how important it is to consider the role that guns have played historically in, you know, protecting white supremacy and trying to, um, you know, confirm in various ways a sense of, you know, U.S. national identity and um, this understanding of protecting civilization from from other folks. So thinking about, you know, this, you know, this connects to an erasure of conditions that produced, uh, you know, the advent of U.S. capitalism as we know it. So, you know, the erasure of profiting off of the labor of African Americans and the land of Native communities that went into, you know, amassing generational wealth for, you know, white families from the colonial era and beyond. And a lot of that generational wealth still exists with, you know, those families. So when we talk about projects of redistribution, and, um, and, you know, re redistributing wealth, you know, thinking about how, you know, uh, a lot of the, the families that profited off of this colonial history are a part of that conversation. So, you know, thinking about how, uh, you know, imperialism and thinking about the expansion of, um, you know, uh, different American forces and whatnot, how often that's a guise for extracting resources. So this is a key part of, uh, you know, the settler colonial project as well, the expansion of settler colonialism as an ongoing structure. So thinking about um, continuing to extract resources abroad and at home. Um, so thinking about, yeah, all of these dynamics that go into continuously reconfirming settler colonialism. So I wanted to connect this conversation to thinking about that Eduardo Benilla Silva piece, The Racial Grammar of Everyday Life, and how, you know, he is thinking about how settler colonialism does continue to engender racial formations in the present by thinking about how everyday practices and logics that 
shape how we see or do not see or even how we feel about race related matters is you know connected to this conversation as well so you know a key example that he offers of racial grammar is thinking about how how missing women are discussed in the media so thinking about you know how he analyzed transcripts of shows like the Nancy Grace show and other Fox News shows and you know the adjectives beautiful or some remark on beauty was always used in the coverage and you know he's using Professor Sherry Park's concept of missing white women syndrome to discuss this lopsided coverage of you know missing white women so thinking about you know not only are the adjectives in these cases you know important to note but thinking about how patterns of coverage so who is talked about um, you know when women go missing, how that is key to thinking about the, the reproduction of racial grammar in various ways. So, you know, we saw this, you know, in a profound way with the Gabby Petito case last year. So, you know, thinking about how this concept of missing white women came to the forefront and how it does offer, you know, a key understanding of thinking about how, uh, you know, the, the ways that we understand race, the ways that we understand, um, you know, how racism continues to be, you know, reinforced as an ongoing structure that, you know, that that's seen generally in, you know, cases about missing persons. It's seen in, uh, you know, true crime narratives. It's seen in, you know, who is discussed, you know, who's left out of the conversation, um, you know, who is searched for, and, you know, yeah, thinking about how all of those dynamics are key to this. So then with the Mitarani Ja piece, you know, she's talking about how the same topic connects to standards of beauty in the U.S. So thinking about how the expansion of white supremacy takes shape in various cultural projects in the U.S., such as the Miss America pageant. So the Miss America pageant played a key role in defining ideas of American exceptionalism. So in other words, you know, this ethos around like the West is best, the West is better than everybody else. America does it best, which is, you know, a, a very limiting and narrow conception that has justified, you know, various projects of U.S. imperialism. And it also does this work of reinforcing Eurocentric beauty standards. So, you know, thinking about with the Miss America pageant, you know, women are tested on how they can adequately um, represent, you know, American ideals and values. So there's like a very like God bless America, you know, feel to it, you know, thinking about, um, you know, how the conceptions of beauty that are intertwined, you know, with this pageant as well are very rooted in eugenics and, you know, Enlightenment era ideals where whiteness was explicitly associated with beauty. So, you know, thinking about how we've seen the Miss America pageant grow in, you know, in terms of representation, but Mitarani Ja critiques it for, you know, continuing to reinforce this colorblind ideology. So in other words, you know, not examining the institutional racism that has created a hostile climate for non-white women um, and instead, you know, thinking through, uh, you know, how representation is very limited um, in uh, actually pushing, you know, a cultural project that has been historically centered on whiteness, um, you know, forward. So thinking about, you know, continuing to interrogate that. But, you know, with that, you know, Mitarani Ja discusses the expansion of the global beauty industry, um, the various industries associated with beauty, how, you know, with capitalism, we see the, um, you know, profiting off of insecurities, how, um, you know, various uh, standards serve to, you know, continue to, you know, generate different forms of competition that will drive profits. So if we keep people insecure, we keep, if we keep people in competition with one another, that is going to, you know, continue to drive up sales for companies in different ways. So let's think a little bit about that Sabrina Strings piece. Uh, so we're thinking about how this also connects to wellness. So like thinking about wellness culture, we see this in social media in everyday life, you know, thinking about how we can interrogate conceptions of wellness and how they reinforce Eurocentric standards of beauty, and also how those standards emerged through white supremacist and ableist scientific discourse around the late 
1800s. So it was this way of deeming what bodies were desirable and acceptable. And we, you know, we see today in many wellness spaces, you know, be it weight loss programs, wellness brands, uh, social media influencers, and so on, um, this, uh, you know, intent on equating thinness uh, with rigid limiting ideals of fitness. Um, so we'll back up for a second, equating thinness and, you know, very rigid ideals of fitness with happiness, health, and purity. So that is really key. So thinking about, you know, these kind of um, like very weird discourses around purity that we'll see and how, you know, Sabrina Strings interrogates that that is you know, very interconnected with eugenics discourse historically. So, you know, thinking about how um, prior to the 1800s, curvaceousness and fatness was understood as an expression of sensuality. It was, you know, seen as very desirable. And Sabrina Strings delves into how there was this key turn uh, from seeing curvaceous women as the ideal. So, you know, with Renaissance painters like Raphael and Botticelli, you know, defining this ideal, um, we saw this distinction between thinness and curvaceousness as a form of racialized social hierarchy. So that was, you know, reproduced by different forms of scientific discourse as well as different cultural texts, so, you know, different forms of art and whatnot. But conceptions of, you know, ideal bodies are really grounded in eugenics with figures like, you know, John Harvey Kellogg, you know, of the Kellogg Corporation, you know, shaping different late 19th century and early 20th century scientific discourse. So, you know, for instance, medical dialogues around this time really centered the standardization of the BMI, so the body mass index, um, and thinking about how, you know, the body mass index sought to measure the height and weight of the average man based on a sample of white European men. So the, you know, the sample of white European men was then positioned as the ideal. And then, you know, people like John Kellogg really advocated for this technology for it to become the gold standard. And, you know, it created a standard essentially around these arbitrary guidelines that really centered particular body types in relation to a white European man, you know, being centered as the ideal. Um, so, you know, with that, you know, thinking about eugenics discourse equated a moral aptitude with these standards, um, and those who failed to meet those standards were regarded as morally inferior. So there's a lot of weird, you know, rhetoric around this at the time. But then, you know, we see this kind of pop up in wellness discourse, too. So, you know, all of this discourse around, you know, clean living, uh, you know, uh, like juicing and, you know, not to say like juices can be delicious, but you know what I'm talking about, that that sense of, you know, really, uh, you know, centering that notion of purity, clean living, um, how that, you know, can be very rigid in various ways. And when we see that rigidity pop up around it, um, how that can be interconnected with disordered eating and how that, you know, does this work of, you know, reaffirming different eugenics rhetoric. So, yeah, that is really key to think about. So I'm going to round out this discussion. Where are we at? We're at 18 minutes. So um, I was trying to keep these as succinct as possible. But yeah, so thinking about we can round this out by returning to Evelyn Nakano's, I can't speak, Evelyn Nakano Glenn's call toward decolonization and thinking about how decolonization must be understood, you know, as a project first and foremost toward indigenous sovereignty. So returning stolen land to get in right relationship with those historically marginalized and preserving the planet. So thinking about a lot of things are at stake here, you know, thinking about climate change is interconnected with this as well. If we think about that reconfiguration of the land from, you know, thinking about it being a symbiotic relationship to it being this extractive relationship that settler colonial logics produced. So, you know, the project of decolonization uh, takes many forms and how it you know demands unearthing and dismantling white supremacy a key aspect of this is you know really interrogating how capitalism impacts social relations so once again it's present in the racial origins of fat phobia thinking about all these wellness companies that will profit
off it off of you know uh, creating a rigidity around you know whose bodies are desirable who's not um, it's present in Eurocentric standards of beauty and the various industries associated with those as well as you know thinking about the uh, you know kind of extractive relationship that um, you know for instance like white influencers white comp white led companies will share to uh, non-white beauty aesthetics so this kind of a way of cherry picking different aesthetics that you know folk that you know folks are not familiar with you know divorcing those aesthetics and traditions from you know the, their original meanings from their original uses and then you know recirculating them to gain some form of financial or social capital so thinking about that is also you know a project of um, you know contemporary uh, colonization as well and it's also you know thinking about how do we intervene you know in uh, these particular spaces that are reproducing white supremacy so intervening in fat phobia intervening in beauty industries that profit off of insecurities and commodifying aesthetics um, and so thinking about this helps us move towards imagining a world that you know doesn't think about humans communities and natural resources as capital um, it helps us envision a world that's not defined you know by settler colonialism as an ongoing structure all right I will shut up now and I hope you all have a wonderful week I hope you all are taking care of yourselves if you need anything uh, you know just let me know don't hesitate to reach out.